So please join me in welcoming Dr. Marla Spivak. Thank you for coming. It's pretty fun to be here. Um, the weather's not so fun, but it will be nicer tomorrow, right? I hope. It's really not very good bee weather out here. So it's a huge honor to be here today. And let me get going here. Um, and to speak to, it's a huge honor to speak on behalf of the bees. Those of, you, those of you who know me know that this mission that I'm on to help bees is not about me. <laughs> It's about the bees, and it always has been. And I feel like I've been swept up in this current that's happening right now. And it, it's a huge current. And it started uh, in 2010 with the MacArthur Fellowship, which was a huge surprise to me, totally unexpected. And it kind of knocked me silly for a while. <laughs> and then I decided to rise to the occasion. I'm all in. If by being all in means that I can do something to affect positive change and action to, on behalf of bees to help bees and beekeepers and all of our bees, our beautiful native bees and our honey bees, if I can do something for them, I'm doing it. So um, I am not a genius by any stretch of the imagination. Ask my family. <laughs> but I am persistent. and. I, I'm really persistent. And I have a big vision and a big dream, and so thank you so much for coming here today and sharing this with me, for listening to the big vision and supporting bees and positive change, because it's happening right now, and, and here we go. Um, the fun part about speaking for bees is that their message is really a good one, and, and it connects to all phases of life, not just bees and flowers and food. It goes way beyond that to their social structure and everything about their biology. And the solution to helping bees and to the plight of bees is actually beautiful. And it's very doable. This is something we can all get our hands around and do something about. So I'll go forward, I think. If you hold it right side up, then forward is forward. <laughs> okay, I'm not letting it go now. Okay. <laughs> the first part of the message is taken hold in just the past year, and it has been heard. We need bees because this is our life with bees. All these fruits and vegetables that they pollinate, they contribute so much to our diet, even the coffee we drink, the food, the alfalfa hay we feed to our farm animals that we should be feeding to our cattle, all of these things, everybody's heard this message. This was from Whole Foods, a big marketing campaign that they did. And the next thing that I think many people are finally realizing is that there's just not one driver to the decline of bees or to the plight of bees. It's not just one thing. There's multiple and interacting causes, and it's a puzzle to figure it out. And this is the same. It's not just our honeybees. This is the same for our native bees also. So honeybees were introduced in the 1600s. We have, in Minnesota, approximately 350 species of native bees that nest in the ground or in, or in twigs. And we don't have a lot of data on them. I'll talk more about them. But many of them are also in trouble. And the reason that they're in trouble is symptomatic of a larger system failure. And that is a lack of diversity in our landscape and a dysfunctional food system, the way we're growing food. And this is in the agriculture, but a lot of this extends even to our urban environments where we grow monocrop grass lawns. But I'm really tired of the bee bummer talk. I began giving <laughs> bee bummer talks in 2007. I had audiences crying. I, <laughs> I had a lady come up after one of them and said, I don't know what to do. This is the most depressing thing I've ever heard in my life. And I realized I can't, I can't go down that path, that I have to 
go there, but then say something positive at the end. And so now's the time for action. And when I um, was invited to give the TED talk last year, I thought a long time about what's my final message? Because I can't leave on that be bummer note. What is that? What can I give people? What is something that everybody can do? And, and yeah, it was easy. Plant bee-friendly flowers and don't contaminate those flowers with pesticides. These are the action steps. And this is what's taking hold. And I don't think it was just me. I think people, there were many people saying similar things at the same time and enough people heard. And it's, like I said, it's a beautiful solution. Flowers are nice. And uncontaminated flowers are great too. So right now what I want to do is move move you, move all of us deeper into this solution. This was just a first pass. Let's get going. Let's take a step out of this thing and move forward. Um, but now what I'd like to do is take us a little bit deeper into this. So let's start with bees and nutrition. Um, in Eastern philosophy, food is medicine. And Western philosophy, if you will, is that you are what you eat. And this is certainly true. I want good, clean food. And the bees do too. They need good, clean food. So we know that when bees have access to a lot of good nectar that they turn into honey, they can... They have, they have enough fuel to f uh, for their daily flights. They store enough honey so that they can survive the winter. They need lots of honey to survive a Minnesota winter. This is a colony in my backyard a couple years ago. It looked the same <laughs> this year. And we also know that bees need diverse sources of pollen. And they need these sources of pollen from flowers over the entire growing season. And that we know from other research that these, this protein really helps their immune systems and their survival. And it turns out that it's, any protein is not good enough. We need, bees need, just like people need lots of diverse proteins in their diet, so do bees. Because different flowers have different amino acids. So you're looking at a kind of a complicated graph that one of my graduate students took off the web here from down there, and it just shows all the different amino acids, arginine, histamine, lysine, and the three that are really critical to bees, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, and how they differ depending on what plant. And so if bees don't get enough of one amino acid, it means they've got to go collect a lot more pollen to bring up that level of amino acid, or preferably find a diversity of flowers so that they get the full complement of amino acids that they need in their diet. Sound familiar? It's the same for us. So we want good, clean food, and so do bees. We want to know what's in our food. We want labels. We want our food label, and so do bees. Now, they can't read and they can't speak, and they really didn't tell me that. So <laughs> I'm just telling you, this is what they want. They want to know what's in that food. We want to know what's in that food so that the bees can eat clean food. And I don't know if, you know if you know this, but if you look at a pesticide label, all of, our, all of our food is labeled. But if you look at a pesticide label, it will tell you what the active ingredient is, and then it will tell you that there are other ingredients or inert ingredients uh, this one's 77.4% inert ingredients, and they will never be labeled. If you go to your pharmacy and you take a medicine, the inactive ingredients, the other ingredients, the inerts, they're always, always labeled. You get to know what the active ingredient is and the inert ingredients, and you know what you're putting in your mouth. And that is not true for bees. Pesticide labeling is a huge issue. And we've known for a very long time that the combination of good nutrition helps, especially with pollen, 
helps bees become less susceptible to the effects of pesticide. This is a research article done in Germany, actually, in the 1980s. Very long, comprehensive article talking about the interaction between nutrition for bees and their ability to detoxify pesticides. Bees can detoxify pesticides, and they can be less susceptible to their effects, but only if they're really well nourished. But how are our bees supposed to cope with multiple pesticides all at the same time? And pesticides include all of the things on the top, which are insecticides designed to kill insects, herbicides, fungicides, and then down here, the adjuvants, the inerts, the unlabeled other ingredients that are added that can be more toxic than the active ingredient. And I'm sorry, I just went right back into that bummer thing. <laughs> so I'm coming out of it now, OK? <laughs> what, what I was talking about in the TED talk is just the tip of the iceberg. Because when I look at the whole system failure, it's, it's overwhelming, all of these things. But if we can do some things, plant flowers, keep them clean, avoid contaminating those particular flowers that we're planting for bee food, if we can keep at least those clean, we're making good steps forward. And so now what I'd like to do is talk about all the other stuff that's under there. And to do this, welcome to the bee lab, because this is what we're doing in the lab, and I have a big a lot of students right now doing a lot of things, and I'm going to take you through everybody's lives, and many of them are here in the audience, and so <laughs> they're PhD students, there's master's students, and I'm going to go very quickly through each one of them, and I encourage you to find them later and get more detail, because I can't possibly go into the detail. I'll lose you all. Here they are. <laughs> this is my crazy group. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the one with the red hat on is, is, he has a twin, but he couldn't get his twin to wear the bee beard, so they just wore hats. <laughs> I'd like to start with Gary Reuter. Gary Reuter has worked f with me for 20 years. When I first came to the University of Minnesota, it was 1993, I believe, and there was a letter in my mailbox saying, um, I think you're probably going to need a technician. I've been a beekeeper, hobby beekeeper all my life. I am an industrial arts teacher. And then he said, I'm open to learning new things. And I went, OK, you're hired. <laughs> I interviewed him. <laughs> and then I hired. And he's stayed on. And he has helped with every graduate student experiment. He helps assist all the students with their experiments. He goes and teaches kids about bees. He helps with all of the beekeeping classes that we teach, mostly to the public. And then he's, he gives lots of talks on his own. So he is, he never likes to take the credit, but without Gary, I wouldn't be anywhere, really. So he makes all these kind of crazy specialty equipment for us. And he, if you ask any of the students, he's the guts of the operation. He's always there, and he drives a long way to get to work, and he never complains about driving. He complains about other things. <laughs> I'm going to start with a couple of students. You're looking at, on the right is Elaine Evans, and on the left is Joel Gardner. These are two students that are really interested in all of our native bees, our wild bees. Our, they're not, well, many of them are not managed. And they have been doing native bee surveys. This is something we need to do to understand what the status of all of our bees are in Minnesota. And there has never really been a comprehensive survey of the bees in Minnesota. So a survey involves collecting bees with sweep nets or other sampling devices, and then you pin them and database them and then have to identify all these bees to species. Very, very labor-intensive work. So Elaine's research, she's doing this for her PhD, she has been doing, she did, a three-year survey of the native bees in the prairie pothole region of North Dakota. Now, why North Dakota is because of the grant I got with some USGS people from North Dakota, the prairie pothole region. But the bees are similar to those in Minnesota, and she'll be continuing to do surveys here in Minnesota. This was research funded by the USDA. And I show you what she's done. She has identified over 11,000 bees 
to date. And five families, 29 genera, 103 species, and comparing with historical records, that's where she's at right now, there was missing one whole family of bees. That's kind of significant that there, she wasn't able to collect them in the three years of her study, and one genus, and a new state record for North Dakota, a new species found. But more interestingly, she's trying to understand how this correlates with the landscape. So she was collecting bees in six different locations, some of them that we would say would be bee-friendly, and this is where the collaboration with USGS came in because we needed them to tell us what was on the ground, what, was, what are the plants on the ground that they could tell us. And so the ones in green, the bars in green, show you locations that are bee-friendly have lots of flowers on them, compared to those that are not. And you can tell with the red line the species abundance of the native bees that she found. So this is really critical to show that where the landscape is not as friendly for bees, you don't find as many bees of our native, of our native species. I would also just like to say that Elaine is also the one that does the bumblebee surveys. She's been doing them since 2007 in the Minneapolis area. She goes to particular um, uh, parks and then surveys the bumblebees because there are four species of bumblebees that are seriously in decline, that ha some haven't been found for a long time, some are extremely rare. And so she goes to the same location and it's a volunteer event and kids come and they go and collect these bumblebees on the flowers. They run back, they show them to Elaine. She looks at them, identifies them right there on the spot, puts a dab of paint on them, and then releases them. So they go back to the, what they're doing. And then if a kid, the next kid comes along and collects a bumblebee with a dab of paint, she doesn't recount that same bee. But she's not collecting them to pin them either. And so she has found um, one of the species that's the rusty patch bumblebee that hasn't been found here for a very long time, she found at Lindale Lake. So if you're interested in the summer of joining Elaine, um, you might go on her Facebook page, Minnesota Bumblebee Survey, and go out with her. And it's pretty fun. Whoops. Joel Gardner just finished his master's degree, and what he did was go up to Lake Itasca, the Lake Itasca State Park. And he um, is really interested in one particular family of bees, the Megachylidae. Okay, <laughs> these are the leaf cutter bees. They include the orchard mason bees and the leaf cutter bees. They nest in tunnels. And what he did was go to Lake Itasca for two, well, two and a half summers, and he collected the bees up there, and he compared them to a historical collection of bees that we have in, in our museum at the University of Minnesota. And this historical collection was taken in 1937 and 1938, and he found that the species richness, the number of bees, and the diversity of bees within this family of bees is now signif significantly lower than it was in 1937 and 1938. And like it says, this is disturbing because Itasca State Park has been a protected area since 1981, 1891. Now all around it is farmland, maybe that influences it. But what are the drivers? What are the causes? We don't really know. But these are the kinds of surveys that we really, really need to do, and we will be doing them henceforth. Okay. See, I'm really not a genius. I can't even push this button. Another student in the lab, Matthew Smart, is in this did a study in the same area of the prairie pothole region of North Dakota. And he's asking a really big question. What are the impacts of the agricultural land use on the survival of honeybee colonies? And he worked closely with a commercial beekeeping operation. Many, many of them are in North Dakota. And they move their bees from North Dakota to California for the almond pollination event. And so he tracked colonies in North Dakota, the same colonies as they went to California and back and back, and back for three years. And he, in the six locations that he was looking at in North Dakota, they're cited numbers one through six, help, with help from the USGS again, we have an indication of what was in those locations. So honeybees fly two miles from their nest, and so this is an indication of what's in a two-mile area. So you can see I circled site three because it has a lot of black and gray, which is soybeans and corn. 
And I circled site six because it has more colors in it, pasture, hayland, flowering, trees, wetlands, grasses, all these areas that have more flowers in them. And then he went and hundreds of samples, he would go measure colony health. So he would take lots of measurements of the colonies of honeybees themselves. And then he also took individual bees. He paint marked baby bees and collected them when they were seven days old, which is no feet, and then bring them back to the lab and do what I'm going to call a little blood test on those bees to look at the nutritional status of those bees and their immune system. How are they? And what he's found, and this is overall three-year average survivorship, the colonies at site three with the soybean and corn had about almost 50%, 45% mortality on average over those three years. Whereas that site six, much, much lower mortality, 10, 12% in comparison. And the mortality was correlated, or actually the survivorship, the health of the colonies, especially at site six, was correlated with the levels of, all these big words for you, vitiligenin and lipids. So vitiligenin is a storage protein, very important for bees, very, very important storage protein for bees, very good indicator of their health, the amount of lipids they had, fats in their system. And so that meant that at site six, the good one, their VG, their vitiligenin levels were higher, their lipid levels were higher, and their immune systems were quieter. It's important to have a quiet immune system because that means you're not having to fight off a bunch of diseases. If your immune system is activated, it means there's a problem, right? You're fighting off a disease or something. So he's looking, he's finding a bee blood test, possibly, a way to collect bees and look at their blood, if you will, to determine as a predictor to determine how they may survive in the upcoming months. So this incorporates pesticide use also. It includes the landscape use, their nutrition, and everything about that whole system of interacting causes. Another student who just came on board is Ian Lane. <clears throat> and he is um, funded by the state of Minnesota through our um, Minnesota Environmental and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Did you know that your lottery money goes into that fund? It's awesome. You need to really support this because there's an effort <laughs> afoot now to try to deplete that fund or divert those funds to other causes. So it's very good that Minnesota decides to use these resources for not use the money resources for natural resources. And so people can apply for grants, and I did, and I got money, they graciously funded me for this project, which I thought was kind of whimsical, but they really liked it, and I do too, and that's to figure out what kind of flowers we can put in our lawns, in the cities, that can bloom, that would reduce the intensive inputs, the amount of water, fertilizer, and mowing that we have to do, and it's research project because you have to figure out what plants you're going to put in there that can withstand mowing, and continue to bloom, and that are still attractive to the bees. So of course, Dutch clover has always been a good one, except that it's not included in our grass mix mixtures anymore. If you buy grass seed, it doesn't have Dutch clover in it anymore. I suppose you could ask for it in there. That's a, that's a great plant to begin with, but we want some more. Let's get some diversity in there for th some areas of lawn that you don't play soccer on, that you don't need to sit on. There's a lot of grass out there that really no one ever uses, right? So it might as well be bee pasture or a bee lawn, and people like it manicured. manicured. It could be mowed. It should, you know, places, even roadsides could be mowed and still flower and, and flower low. So this is what Ian is doing this summer, is his re first real summer of research. He'll have a lot of test plots on the St. Paul campus, and he'll be um, seeding hard fescue instead of Kentucky bluegrass. He'll use a different kind of grass that requires less input to begin with. He'll seed this fescue with different seeding rates of different flowers, and then mow it <laughs> and see what happens. It's great research. OK. Hey, Ian, go away now. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Another graduate student, Judy Wu. Judy Wu Smart. Um, she's studying the effects of neonicotinol, the neonicotinoid, 
insecticide class, and her approach is to look at its effects on queen honeybees and on queen bumblebees. This has never been done. She is funded by the EPA. She wrote an EPA, Environmental Protection Agency grant, STAR Fellowship, and so they are paying very, very close attention to her work, and um, so far very pleased with her work, and of even offering to do some of her residue analysis, which is quite expensive, and they're gonna do it in their lab, which is really good. So they're very supportive, and so what she's trying to do and I'll just talk about the honeybee part of it because she'll be doing the bumblebee part coming up. She fed varying amounts of imidacloprid, and that's one of the kinds of neonicotinoids. So maybe I should have said the neonicotinoids are in the news now because it's a class of insecticides that's systemic, meaning it runs through the plant and is expressed or translocated in the leaves in all parts of the plant into the nectar and the pollen. And so bees can pick up a little bit or sometimes a lot of this compound when they're feeding. And so we're curious to know the, the worker bees for honeybees bring, would bring it into the nest and then does it get to the queen? And if it gets to the queen, what are the effects of the queen? Because beekeepers frankly are seeing problems with queen bees right now, and we don't know if this is the full thing that's going on, but maybe it's contributing. And so the photo on the left, if you're not a beekeeper, is a comb coming straight out of a bee colony, and we keep them in these wooden frames, they hang in the boxes, and let's see if I can get this pointer. Okay, apparently not. I have a pointer. <laughs> that stuff, <laughs> that's um, what we call sealed brood. It's worker pupae, it's developing pupae. So butterflies have a chrysalis and bees have a little pupa. It's under a wax cap and it's, they spun a little silk cocoon under that wax cap and it's developing, okay? So that pattern that brood pattern, we call it, when the queen came and laid, and that it's nice and solid and only a few skips, means that the queen was doing a good job. And this empty patch in the middle is because the little baby bees chewed their way out of the wax capping, and now they're adult bees, and they left, and the queen bee will come back and fill in, start laying eggs in the middle there. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's our control. That's bees that were just fed sugar syrup with no imidacloprid. And here's what happens if you feed them 20 ppb, so 20 parts per billion in sugar water, 50 ppb, and 100 ppb, and you can see the whole brood area, the amount of the sealed brood here is way less, and spotty. The queen, in fact, when Judy measured her activity, she, in even as low, and I don't have the picture here, but even as low as 10 parts per billion, which is very low and considered a, 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 a dose that shouldn't affect the bees. Way, if it's sublethal, it's even under sublethal effect. But it did, when it got to the queen, it did affect her egg laying rate and her activity rate. That's kind of scary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, here. Okay. Moving on. There we go. Thanks for tolerating my inability to do this. Another student in the lab, he'll be finishing his PhD this summer. This is Mike Goblersch. He's the one with the twin with the red hat on. Mike's done an incredible thing and totally unplanned and, as you can see, funded on a shoestring because it was, it was a, a fluke. Uh, another professor in our department, Dr. Tim Curdy, came into the lab when Mike was there one day and said, Do, isn't there a honeybee cell line, a cell culture? And I'll explain what that is in a minute. And Mike said, no. And Dr. Curdy said, well, let's, let's get one going. And so Mike was working on a different project on bee diseases. He was looking at nosema, which is a gut parasite of bees. He did a very nice study on the effects of nosema disease on bees. We thought originally that was one of the causes of colony collapse. And then kind of on nights and weekends and when I wasn't looking, <laughs> he would um, 
play with this cell culture. So how many have you have read the, the book um, about Henrietta Lacks? The, what's the name of that book? The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. If you haven't read that book, read it, because it is how a, a human cell line got developed. This is just cells taken from a human tissue, and then they're grown in the lab culture, and they're used in medicine. So all of our vaccines and many of our modern day medicines and cures and treatments we have for cancer, polio, on and on and on, come from having a cell line that you can keep in the laboratory free of all the other influences of the rest of the body so that you can see the impact of a disease or a virus directly on a human cell. And this is how mo modern medicine really works. We didn't have one for a honeybee. So Mike went and got honeybee eggs, which are basically embryos, and he just tried all kinds of different mediums under the tutelage of Dr. Curdy. And after a year of messing with this thing, he, Eureka, he has it. And it's just like the Henrietta Lacks story, <laughs> except that it's from a honeybee line. And, and now he is distributing it all over. So we have a material transfer agreement through the university. Um, we want to give it away. We, it's, we're, ha we're hoping that everybody worldwide will get a little bit of this cell culture and start doing research so that we can understand lots of different things. And this is just a small list of where he's already sent some of his cell line for research. It's very, very exciting. Another area of research in the lab is on propolis. So propolis is basically plant resin that bees collect. So bees go to certain plants and they scrape these sticky resins off, off of the leaves and they stick them on their back legs. So the bee in the middle there, the red stuff on her legs is resin. And she brings the resins back to the nest and she sticks them in the hive, the nest cavity. And so this photo on the right is a picture of the inside of a hollow of a tree where bees nested and they coated the entire nest lining with resin. And once the resin is inside the nest, we call it propolis. So the bees can mix the resin with a little bit of wax, but as far as we know, they're not changing the chemistry of the resin. They're not introducing new compounds into it or not changing it as far as we know. It, but uh, they're just adding a little bit of wax. We know that these resins and propolis, well, the resins themselves have really diverse antimicrobial properties. They are medicine. They're medicine for the plant. They help the plant ward off diseases and infections. And when the bees collect them and put them in the nest, we now know that it helps the bees, especially their immunity. So there have been three students, two, well, there's three students, one was, the first one was Mike Simone Finstrom, who finished his PhD. He was the first one to show that a propolis envelope within a colony, a layer of propolis in a honeybee colony, really helped the bee's immune system. Mike Wilson just defended his PhD two weeks ago, and he has done a lot of the chemistry. Where, what are these resins coming from? What, what are they? What plants are they coming from? And what is their antimicrobial activity? So he takes a disease and then tries different types of resin to see how active the resin is in fighting off different bacterial pathogens or fungal pathogens. And Renata Borba, who is here, um, is a PhD candidate. And she's continuing on with the research. She's looking at the effects of a natural propolis envelope. Well, here, these are the questions that we're asking. How does a natural propolis envelope help the bee immunity? When Mike Simone did it, it wasn't a natural one. He painted on an envelope, so Renata's taking it a step further. Can, if the bees build a natural envelope in, a, in modern day beekeeping equipment, can we encourage them to do this, and how will that help them? And do the colonies with this propolis envelope inside have less disease? And what are the plant sources? And are some more antimicrobial than other? And then kind of the most amazing question that may or may not be so 
Do bees choose resins? Can they choose their medicine? Are they self-medicating? So if they have a disease, are they going to go collect resins that have more antimicrobial properties than others? So these are the questions that Mike Wilson answered some and Renata will be answering, so stay tuned. All of those studies, particularly the propolis one, are part of a greater theme that I've been really interested in for a very long time, and that is how do bees help themselves? What are bees' natural defenses? This has been my main interest in research since I began doing research on bees, basically. It's like, they're so amazing. What is their healthcare system? What do they do for themselves? How do they keep themselves healthy without a beekeeper? Because they've been here much, much longer than humans have. So what was their original way of staying healthy? And can I describe those mechanisms? We call it social immunity when a colony of honeybees, when all the individual bees within the nest are performing behaviors that act like an immune system within a single organism. So a colony of honeybees, for me, is the organism. And the individual bees are acting like cells within the organism. And then within an individual bee, each individual bee has an immune system, has cells within its organism. So it's multi-layered and it's totally fascinating. So originally, well, I'll just go to this one. Right now, this, the antimicrobial defenses is part of one form of social immunity, and the resin collection falls under that kind of category. But before we got into the resin and propolis studies, I did a lot of work on hygienic behavior. And I want to talk about this particular person here now. This is Rebecca Masterman, Becky Masterman. She was my very first PhD student. She finished in 2000. And she was looking at this hygienic behavior. What it is, is on the top left, in addition to not being able to push a button, I can't tell left from right. All right, on the top left for you, hygienic behavior is the ability of some bees to detect diseased brood and remove it from the nest. So they do this before it's infectious, and they're very, very good at it. They can detect. We didn't know how they detected it. And so Becky's studies were looking at the neural mechanisms, the neural mechanisms of this behavior. And she did a lot of poking and prodding bees. And I want to show you this top right photo is a bee brain. And it's stained for octopamine, which is a neural transmitter. And she found that when bees were in the middle of performing hygienic behavior, their brains lit up with this neural transmitter. And we know that that neural transmitter helps with their olfactory sensitivity, in other words, their sense of smell. And so we got to this question of how do they find out that the, 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 the brood or the baby bees are sick? They smell them. OK. So Becky did this PhD, and then she went on to do other stuff, and now she's back. <laughs> and she is the captain of the Bee Squad program. So that, what I just talked to you about, was a lot of the research that we've done over the last 20 years and that we're doing now. And in addition to doing research, part of my job description is to do extension and outreach, which means working with beekeepers and working with the public. In addition to classroom teaching, I have an extension component to my job. It's a huge demand. There is huge demand for information on beekeeping right now. There's a huge surge in urban backyard beekeeping. And I and Gary and I couldn't keep up with it. And so I decided to use some of the MacArthur Foundation money to start a bee squad program. And that's where this came from. So originally, it, last year, we started with Jody Gertz, uh, lower left. She started the program, um, got married and moved, well, not married yet. She moved to Australia. <laughs> and now Becky has taken over. And um, we, this is the B Squad crew. We now have many new people. Jessica Helgen, actually, she's not new. Chris Kulhanik, Jenny Warner, Warner, and Clara Costello, our newest addition. The, this program is truly amazing. Um, it's part of the B Lab. And it's again, fulfills the mission to help beekeepers and to help bees. So there's different parts of the program. The hive to bottle part of the program, the customers purchase the bees, and then they get one of the Bee Squad employees' expert assistance on keeping the bees. And then 
the honey goes to the customer. So we're the beekeeper, and we um, and the the bee squad. I'm sorry, the hive to bottle people, the people that have the bees on their properties, have become amazing ambassadors to the bees and to the bee lab. And so this event is because Jennifer Martin has bees on her roof and is really, really supportive of the bee program and of bees in general. And Aveda has bees on their property and they're doing really amazing things. They're starting to plant a whole lot of flowers up there to help the bees. So not only do they have bees on the corporate headquarters, and they we're helping them keep them as naturally as possible with as few treatments as possible, they're also planting for the bees. So they're doing the two-pronged approach, which is really great. There's lots of hive to bottle families and organizations, and what they've this was kind of an unexpected consequence of the Bee Squad program, but now with our relationships with people, with the places that Becky's finding to put bees on rooftops and at, at, a corporate, at headquarters and different locations, all of these places are now helping spread the word about the importance of bee health to their communities. And once they get a hive of bees on their property, they start realizing, oh, where are the flowers for the bees? What are they going to eat? How far do they fly? And is that food clean? We need good food for the bees, and it needs to be clean. They need the same things that we do. And so now everybody, these people are starting to pay attention. We also part of the Bee Squad program. We, have a, we help beekeepers by having a mentoring apiary. If you're a beekeeper, you have questions, you can come to our location, and we'll, we'll walk you through different scenarios and help you troubleshoot all your bee problems. We also can do some emergency responding. When there was a bee kill last summer in the Kenwood neighborhood when a homeowner or somebody uh, applied fipronil, which is a, an insecticide that you use around the foundation of a house, and it spread somehow, drifted onto or got onto flowers in the neighborhood, three bee colonies within a mile of each other were exposed to this pesticide application, and bees came back. And what you're looking at there is a pile of dead and twitching bees. So we were able to, along with the Department of Agriculture, Minnesota Department of Ag, go out and sample the bees and get to the bottom of it. And then, because of that, um, one of the colonies that was hit by this insecticide was owned by um, Aaron Rupp and Christy Lynn Allen, <laughs> Christy Allen, who run the Bees Knees program. And they got angry. And they decided we're going to move to action. And they created a, an initiative called Healthy Bees, Healthy Lives. And they're pushing legislation through right now, which I'll talk about coming up. Just amazing, all in response to this bee kill. It's sorry, it's horrible that action doesn't happen until there's a crisis. But apparently, that's the way humans operate. <laughs> OK. So in addition to the Bee Squad program, that's designed to help urban beekeepers. It's becoming very successful and I hope very helpful. At the same time, there's another huge program within my lab. <laughs> it's actually nationwide. And it's called Tech Transfer Teams. And it's part of a national initiative called the Bee Inform Partnership. This was a grant funded by the USDA to a researcher who's at the University of Maryland, Dennis Van Engelsdorp. But part of that is the part that I'm working on under the Bee Inform Partnership umbrella is to provide help for our commercial beekeepers, those migratory beekeepers that move their bees across the nation for pollination services. Those are the ones, those are the bees that are pollinating our apples, our almonds, our blueberries, our squash, our pumpkins, et cetera, et cetera. Our seed crops, if you plant vegetable seed, it's pollinated by bees. It's because the beekeepers took their bees into those crops for those pollination services. These beekeepers are having a heck of a time keeping their bees alive with all the pesticide exposure and disease transmission. And so what we decided to do was establish a team of professionals. And I should have mentioned, if I can go back. <laughs> oh, Katie Lee. <laughs> 
who is running the tech team here at the University of Minnesota, and she's also doing her PhD. She'll be using the data she collects from the services that she provides for the beekeepers for the help to do an epidemiological study on, on what's going on with these bees. So Katie's here, and you'll get to meet her. But what, what she does with others, and there's a tech team here in Minnesota and North Dakota, and there's one in Northern California, one thing that they do is work with bee breeders. Those are the beekeepers that are raising the genetics, the queen bees for sale for across the United States. And we're working very closely with them to help them figure out which colonies they can use as breeder colonies so that they can improve their selection for bees that are more resistant to diseases and mites. And the great thing about it is one of the things that they're selecting for is hygienic behavior that behavior that we studied and that Becky studied for so many years in the lab, we have a way to assay for that in the beekeepers' colonies. And here's happy beekeepers showing that, yes, my bees are really hygienic, and I can breed from these bees, and we can get the commercial beekeeping population back on track and, and hopefully healthy. Okay, I'm winding up here. So the legislative efforts that are going on in Minnesota right now are awesome. I think, to my knowledge, we're the only state that has two bills in the legislature right now that are designed with a specific reason to help bees. One of them that actually they passed last year, the Pollinator Habitat Bill, that ha uh, uh, specified that the state of Minnesota has to have best management practices for, for um, providing good habitat in, for pollinators in urban areas, in, in agricultural areas, and as much as possible in our roadsides. So they're coming up with these management practices, and they have to do, the Department of Ag has to do a full review of the use of neonicotinoids in the state of Minnesota. That happened last year, 2013. Right now in this session, there are two bills. One is to label nursery plants. If you're selling nursery plants that are pollinator friendly, if bees will visit them, then they need to be labeled that they have, if they've been treated or not. This is an incredible bill. It's, you need to push for this bill. I think this one will pass. The next one is a beekeeper compensation bill. Beekeepers have never been compensated for pesticide loss. And they don't have, their insurance policies cannot cover the bees. They cover the equipment but not the bees. If their bees are hit by a pesticide, commercial beekeepers or backyard beekeepers, there's no compensation. So this is the first bill ever that I know of that will provide some compensation to beekeepers if their colony was killed by a pesticide. This is really good, so really push for that one. There's proposals in from that, uh, the lottery money, the Minnesota um, Environmental Trust Fund, for a new professor to help me whew, with pollinator habitat ecology to take some of the research and help with plant, what can we plant for bees and where should we plant. There's uh, initiatives in there for statewide native bee surveys to help Elaine and Joel and others. The Department of Natural Resources will be doing a lot of these. There's a new proposal in the works for citizen science for bees so that everybody can be helping monitor bees. And a new proposal going in on what ornamental flowers and, and varieties are better for bees. So you go to the nursery and you get petunias and you go, I don't know if this is bee friendly or not. And which variety of petunia or which variety of monarda or which variety of rose should I buy if I want it to be pollinator friendly? So John Irwin is the one that submitted that proposal. So all of, there's a million things going on. It's like the tide broke, the dam broke, something, there's a huge, Effort, many, many efforts going on in Minnesota to help bees. It's super exciting. Finally, back to my vision. So since I came to Minnesota, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to have a facility where the public could come learn about bees. And this part of my dream is, is coming true. It, it's coming true right now mostly because of this amazing woman. This is Alice Tashtian, and she and her family donated $2 million to go to the Landscape Arboretum, which is part of the Uni University of Minnesota. And with a little bit more fundraising, 
they will build a pollinator discovery center and they're going to put this thing out by the red barn at the far end of the arboretum where you probably don't even know but it's a gorgeous area and it'll be part of a community food place so they're going to combine food and bees and cooking and growing community gardens it'll be a really awesome place it'll have a space in there where kids can come in and learn about bees and people yes <laughs> now the second part, and for me, the bigger part of my dream and vision is to have a new bee research lab. So this is our current bee research lab. It's a 900 square foot garage that's pretty amazing if you come inside of it. You'd enjoy it. You'd get a good laugh. <laughs> but to accommodate all of the research that I just talked to you, all of the people and programs that we do, we're trying to do out of this lab and a small little molecular lab or technical lab in Hodson Hall. And so we really need a new space. And if we get this new professor, which looks like we will, that new professor on pollinator habitat ecology will also need to share this space. The university, after all my, this is the persistence part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they finally said, OK. <laughs> And they submitted the Bee Lab as part of their capital improvement request to the legislature this year. It's part of a three-pronged project. It's called the Laboratory Improvement Fund. They're asking the legislature for $12 million for three projects. One of them is the Bee Lab, one of them is um, aquatic invasive species, and one of them is an efficient greenhouse. And all three of them together, they're a bundle. <laughs> They, one goes, they all go. So please, please ask all of our Minnesota state representatives and senators to fund the, B, the Laboratory Improvement Fund for the St. Paul campus because this will get my research lab built. <laughs> I'm really optimistic. This is President Kaler of the university. He came by and visited us. Karen Kaler, his wife, is a huge bee supporter. They're looking down into uh, a tree cavity that had a bee nest in it. We're showing him the propolis envelope. And, and he's super excited and super uh, supportive of the whole bee program. So with everything that's going on in the legislature, with your support here today, with everything that's going on, I'm really optimistic that I don't have to give that bee bummer talk ever again. So I want to thank you. I thank the bees, I thank beekeepers, and especially all the supporters, everybody out there that can do simple things like planting flowers for the bees. So thank you for coming. I really appreciate it.